Hello, my name is Todd Crumley, pastor of Harvest Church here in Sox, Missouri. We want to invite you into our service this morning where we want to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. The Bible tells us and Jesus exhorts us to go into the highways and byways and compel them that his house be filled. He's also called us and challenged us to take the gospel all around the world. We hope something is said here today that encourages you or challenges you to walk for Jesus Christ. Enjoy our service. I'm going to ask all of our uh, dads, grandpas, and father figures to stay in this morning, if you will. And uh, this morning you play an important role. And I know sometimes uh, on Father's Mother's Day we build them up. And for some reason on Father's Day we want to tear them down. You know, I don't know what the, why that's like that. But we need to learn to honor and cherish our dad because they won't always be here. They won't always be here with the guy. And I appreciate you here this morning. As a father, a grandfather, an uncle, whatever the case may be, a friend. But we all, whether Eugene, can mentor somebody that's not our own flesh and blood that doesn't have a father, doesn't have a grandpa, doesn't have somebody there that can stand in the gap. But we can all uh, point to somebody, Brother Keith. Point, I appreciate Brother Keith being a being a foster parent over the years you know he's, he's brought in several kids into his home you know not knowing them not knowing their background their their their, their preference of, of where they came from whatever it may be but brother keith loved them enough and his wife took both of them as a team to bring them in and to put a roof over their head and, and to be a family figure to them you know uh the world the world is looking for that brother finley Sister Jill and brought children into their homes over the years and helped out. It, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing to do, and to see the love of people that, that care for children. And Sister Janet said the best: this world needs men, not just men, but women who love children, because there's children all over this world. Sister Jill, that's hurting, that's lost and undone, that don't have hope, don't have help. And we're blessed, brother Larry. We're blessed. I'm going to ask everybody else now to stand up. And if there's a dad close to you, a grandfather next to you, whatever it may be, I want you to put your hand on their back or their side, whatever the case may be, but I want you to pray for them this morning. Hold them up in prayer as we pray. And pray a prayer for these dads. Don't say a prayer, but pray a prayer for you. I'm going to ask Sister lead us out, and I'll pray together for our dads. Blessed Jesus, Masters, we come to you this morning. I thank you, Lord, for all the men that are here this morning, Lord, the father figures, Lord, here in our church, Lord, the grandparents, Lord, grandfathers, fathers, uncles, Lord, best friends to children, to grandchildren, whatever the case may be this morning. I thank you, Lord, that they're here. I thank you, Lord, that you placed them here in our church at Harlan Harvest, Lord. I plead the blood of Jesus over them, Lord, that they would love their children, they would love their grandchildren, Lord, their uh, nieces, nephews, just children in general, Lord, whatever the case may be, Lord, that they would uphold and encourage, Lord, this next generation, Lord, that's lost and undone and dying for a father figure, Lord. We ask you, Lord, this morning to bless our men, give them strength physically, Lord, give them strength spiritually, oh God, I pray, give them wisdom and understanding, oh God, and bless their lives for the glory of God today, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Let them be examples here in our church. Let them be men of faith, men of valor, men of courage, men of honor, Lord, and I pray you bless their footsteps, oh God, today. Lord, you'd honor everything they do. Lord, let them encourage their children and grandchildren this morning, Lord. Let them be a light and example to all those around them this morning, Lord. Bless them, I pray today. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for our, our fathers, Lord, for our men here in our church. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Give one of them a hug this morning. Close to you. Tell me you appreciate them. I do appreciate the Lord this morning. Appreciate each of you being here. Uh, I know we got several that's away. I know some on vacation, just leaving this week. Some coming back this week, and I understand that some away at church with their fathers. I understand that. I'm glad to have those that came this way to be with their family this morning. But uh, most of all, it's good to have Jesus with us this morning. And uh, we're just going to look at a couple of scriptures here this morning, different. Uh, well, maybe we'll under a couple of scriptures. But if you have your Bible, we'll turn to Judges chapter uh, 2. We'll start up there here in a few minutes, Judges chapter 2. And then we'll look at a couple other scriptures this morning. But Father's Day, and, uh, you know, I appreciate, like I say, our fathers. And I know we uh, play a 
a battered roll every now and then, Brother Eugene. You know, it, you know, we burn the candle at both ends a lot of times, and uh, we, we push the envelope as far as we can sometimes, and I appreciate uh, the strength that God gives us and undergirds us, and we're able to do what we can do, you know, and again, that we do work here at the church, and, and if our families, our homes, our communities, you know, and uh, Sister Janet was uh, very truthful in what she said, that, uh, you know, there's a world out there that doesn't see that, Sister Linda, anymore. There's a, there's a generation growing up now who we're at that doesn't see their father doesn't know what a father figure is you know doesn't doesn't have a dad there at the house uh to to be there all the time the story goes the father had five children and won a toy to raffle he called all his kids together all five of them yeah that's which one should have the present the father asked who's the most obedient who never talks back to his mother who does everything she says Five small voices answered in unison, okay, Dad, you get the toy. <laughs> Today, Dad gets the toy. Today, Dads get the toy. We own on our fathers, and, and not just our fathers. It takes a family, fathers and mothers, uh, to do what we do, to able to uh, make our homes function, our churches function, and make the world, as old saying is, go around. And we want to honor our fathers this morning, and we thank God for our fathers. We thank God for these that are faithful, these that stand in the gap, these that are always there uh, to stay up at late at night to work extra hours. Sometimes, Sister Linda, because they have to have overtime, they get up early to go into work, work weekends, whatever the case may be, to provide, to be there for their families, to, to pay the bills, to get toys or whatever teenagers need. They're there always to be there. We want to honor them more than just on a day. We should honor them every day like we, we should our mothers. We need to honor them not because it's a tradition, but because God says so. Because God says to honor them. And we, I didn't tell you to turn there, but uh, uh, most of you know this. Ephesians 1 and 3 says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. And all the fathers said, <laughs> Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, the word says, with promise with promise that's the first commandment with promise honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth and that's not king james version but honor your mother and father notice here now i don't i won't have time to get into all this and this is tough slaying sometimes but the word does not say honor only good moms and dads and life's not fair. But the word says honor them. Somehow, shape, fashion, or form, find something in there to honor them and respect them and to understand who they are and what they are in your life. It didn't say honor just the good moms and the good dads. It doesn't say honor them if you like them. It doesn't say honor only the right ones. It says honor your father and mother. Honor them. Somewhere along the line, we may look back and say, I didn't have a good dad. I hope that's not the case. But if you did, there's something in there you can honor him. Something There had to be some good somewhere. There had to be something good somewhere to honor them and, and to show some type of respect for them. But we're to honor them. Uh, and again, a dad is not just a, and we shared this while ago too, a dad is not just a dad, it's a biological dad. You can be a dad to any child or teenager doesn't know who their father is, doesn't have a father figure. You know, that there's a world out there dying again. Sister Linda said a while ago, that doesn't know who their dad is, doesn't know who their family, doesn't know where dad is at or whatever. And they're dying out to have a father figure somewhere, take them to a ball game, uh, have a smile, just talk to them, Sister Gerald, and, and encourage them because they don't get it at home. And they don't see these things, Grandma Jenkins. They don't see all these things that are going on, and they're looking for somebody. So go out of your way. Laugh with somebody. Share with a child. Uh, encourage them. Somehow or another, we're all involved in raising this next, this next generation. Are you hearing me this morning? And if you're not a dad, listen to me. You are a dad in the spiritual realm. God has called us and is challenging us today to get involved with this next generation because this next generation is losing out. Oh, hello, somebody. This next generation is losing out. 
and they're dying spiritually for somebody to stand in the gap for them and show them there's a better life than what the world is presenting. Today, whether you want to admit it or not, or you want to accept the consequences or not, or you want to accept the facts, you are engaged in a spiritual warfare this morning. And what hangs in the balance of this warfare is this next generation. Oh, hello, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen this morning. We're engaged in a warfare, and the enemy is not going to let up because if he can destroy this next generation coming up, he's destroyed the future of our country, the future of the church, the future of our economy. He understands if he can wipe out this younger generation coming up, it all stops. It all ceases. We're engaged in a war. We're engaged in a spiritual battle. And the battleground is not the Middle East. The battleground is not overseas. The battleground is not a different country. The battleground is in your backyard, at your house. When you go home this morning or this afternoon and you see your children or grandchildren, you just got engaged in a battle because I want to tell you something. The enemy is throwing everything at them he can to destroy them. You need to learn to get involved in what they watch on TV, what they're looking at on their phones, who they're talking to, who they're hanging out with, and if they don't like it, guess what? They just don't like it. Hello, somebody. They need to know we care. They need to know we understand that we know what's best down the road for them than they know themselves. I thought my mom and dad was the dumbest people <laughs> in earth when I was about 16, brother guy, or 18. <laughs> Thought I knew more than I did. We really got all the way. I sound more like them all the time. Because it wasn't dumb. I was dumb. And they need they need to be instilled, Brother Jamie, because we've been there, done that. They may not always want to listen. They may not always act like they're listening. They may not care what we're saying. But we keep on the battlefield. We keep pumping it at them. We keep throwing it at them. We keep telling them this is right. We keep telling them they need to be in church. We keep telling them they need Jesus. We keep telling all these things. Well, sooner or later, it'll stick. Sooner or later, because the Bible tells us, do what? Train up a child. There we go. Train them up. Dads, train them up. Moms, train them up. Don't give up. Don't quit. The battleground... It's not the Middle East. The battleground is our homes. And what's at stake is not our land. It's not our property. It's, it's, it's not our freedom. It's more than that. All those things are, 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 are part of it. You say, what's more important than that? It's our children and our future. We're at war. Whether you want to believe it or not, whether you want to accept that responsibility or not, you're at war. In this country, unfortunately, and I love this nation as much as anybody else, but spiritually we're losing the battle. Spiritually we're losing the battle. Children today, and I won't go into all the numbers here, I'll give you some facts here in a minute, but children today are turning from the faith in record numbers. When they leave home, for some reason, just children, they leave church. Not all of them, but... but Statistically speaking, most of them leave. It's just like as soon as they walk out the door and go to college, they leave church. They walk away. They turn away. We can't blame the church. That's the cop-out. We can't blame the church. That's a cop-out. That's the easy way out. That's an excuse. The church was never given your children, my children to raise. We're here to exhort, to uplift, encourage, and pray. But at the end of the day, your children, God gave you to raise. And when you come down here and most of you came down and, and dedicated your children to the Lord, you promised God you'd raise them in a godly home. You'd bring them to church. You'd do your best to be a responsible mother and father and raise them. So at the end of the day, the fault's not the church. The fault's the one you look at in the mirror. Hello, somebody. Oh, I know it's tough preaching this morning. They leave, and it seems as soon as they leave, they turn. I'm not, again, I don't say everybody, but uh, we'll look at uh, the book of Judges. I said we're going to start to look at the book of Judges, chapter 2, right quick. Book of Judges, chapter 2.
Judges chapter 2. I get my eyeballs on here. Judges chapter 2. We'll start at verse 6. Judges chapter 2. Verse 6. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served, served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Now notice it says here that all these people that served all the days of Joshua, they were around Joshua, they had saw, and all the elders that outlived Joshua had seen all the great works. Now notice it says there again, seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Verse 8, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of the inheritance of in, uh, Timothy Harris, that might not be pronounced right, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gash. And also all that generation were gathered to the fathers. Now notice what happens in a generation later. And there arose another generation after them, which did what? which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. One generation. One generation. All the great things, all the works, Brother Finley, all the miracles, all the hand of God on their life, watching the prophets and watching Joshua and all the elders work, and do all these things God had called them to do out in the wilderness. And now they're getting ready to go in and to possess the promised land. They were getting to be scattered out, you know, this tribe going here, Brother Keith. And this tribe going over there and getting ready to inherit the land. And, and all of a sudden this great generation dies off and the elders begin. To, and one generation later, the word says, they rose up and didn't know God. Didn't know the great works which he'd done for Israel. One generation. Whew. I want to tell you, we're one generation away from losing out. We're one generation away, Sister Kim, of losing out. He said, Brother Todd, I thought you were going to run us down this morning. Well, I'm trying not to. I'm telling you, we're in a battle. We're in a battle. We're fighting, Sister Janie, for our children and our grandchildren and the success of the body of Christ if Jesus tarries long enough. Who? What's our legacy going to be? What's our legacy, Brother Eugene, going to be? The video we showed a while ago at the end of it said something about how, how great is your shadow. What's our shadow going to be? Who's, gonna, who's coming behind? Who's picking up the mantle behind us? Who's going to come in behind us? Uh, we sit back and we talk about the great generation before and the great generation of this. And we talk about all the, uh, the generation or two generations ago in the church, you know, and all the great miracles and all these things that happened. I'm not knocking all that, but something's happened along the way, a downhill effect, if you will. And now we're struggling to do things that they used to do. We're struggling to hang on. We, we don't see the great thing. Well, God hasn't changed. God hasn't changed, but yet we see a difference in society. Uh, said here that one generation later didn't know the Lord, uh, didn't know uh, the great works of God. They forsook the Lord and their fathers that had brought them out of Egypt. And they, this is verse 12. We'll just go ahead and read verse 12. You still got your Bible. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now, not only now, verse 10. Have another generation grown up. Verse 11 says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. One generation. One generation. But you know, we brought them to church. We brought our kids to church. But we brought our grandkids to church. Yeah, but there's a difference in bringing them up and training them. There's a difference in showing them what church is supposed to be and how it's supposed to be and, and living it at home and, and, and praying and doing all these things and just coming to church and saying we've done our time. If you don't think your children don't see that, ask them. What would happen today if I asked your children, did Daddy pray with you at home at night? What would they say? What would they say? 
If I ask them, did, 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 you, did your dad teach you to pay your tithes and to give an offering? Did your dad teach you these things? I taught both my girls when they first got jobs at, at 16 year old. I told them, I said, you want to be blessed financially? You're going to learn to pay your tithes. I said, pay them. You want to be blessed financially? You're going to have to give them to the Lord and let him bless you. Margaret used to brag on Rebecca back in the day when she first got work that Rebecca would come every week and pay her tithes. Elena paid her tithes while she was here. Let me tell you something. That's not the church's job to teach, to train children to pay tithes. That's your responsibility as moms and dads. That's your responsibility to teach them to pray and seek God. Let them know that God is for them and not against them. We blame the church for a lot of things when the church shouldn't get the blame. A whole generation had been gathered together, and now they've grown up not knowing the Lord. The Israelites did evil on the side of the Lord. They walked away and began to do terrible things uh, in front of God. They turned away. They walked away. They worshiped different gods. This day and hour, we watch children walk away from, from when they get out, or get married, go to call, whatever it may be. They walk away, and it seems like they immediately walk away from God. And again, I'm not saying everybody. Statistics say most of them. They worship other gods. How about the God of television? The God of fashion? How about the God of convenience? The God of this world. They worship the world. They worship things that they see. They worship things that they get entangled with because of uh, what's going on around them, what's going on at school, at college, in their neighborhoods. Uh, I want you to look at what Romans says about the same thing. Romans verse 1 Romans 1 28 and 32 Romans chapter 1 verse 28 32 very familiar scripture here Romans chapter 1 verse 28 through 32 and even as they did not like to retain and their knowledge God right off the bat Romans 1 and 28 says what and even as they did not like to retain God and their knowledge What's the next verse, the next line say? God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to the same, but have pleasure in doing, in pleasure in them that do them. We're living in a terrible time. We're living in a terrible culture. We're living in a terrible society. And yet we live in a society that approves of turning its back on God. It's okay to mock church. It's okay, Brother Keith, to mock Christians. It's okay to talk about them, to despise them, to ridicule them. It's all right to pass laws against them to try to keep, to keep them shut down and to keep them quiet. But yet, what are we telling our children at home? Are we telling them as moms and dads, it doesn't matter what the world says, God is the answer. Are we pouring into them the Word of God and letting them know this is what's going to get you through? We was looking for a truck for Andrew here. Uh, he turned 16 a few weeks ago, and we was looking back and forth, and his price range was up here, and mine was down here. <laughs> looking back and forth here, that and the other, and kept looking back and forth. And we've been praying the whole time, you know, and, and looking and couldn't get together. And just there, and sitting there watching TV one afternoon, he was looking Craigslist, whatever it was, and stuff. And I just blurted out, I guess you could say blurted out. But just came, I looked at him and said, you know what, Andrew, if we really pray and seek God, we won't have to look for a truck or car. It'll come to us. And it's just as I spoke that, it confirmed in my spirit, Sister Janie. No, no, no miracle, nothing major, but I just felt the peace come over. That week, Brother Keith, three automobiles come our way. What are we instilling in our children? Prayer is the answer. God is the answer. God's ways are the ways we need to be training this next generation. God's ways are the things we do before them, the way we, we conduct our lives. We, we live in a society where everything disapproves of God. It's all right to turn their back on God. From court cases to TV to popular movies, it's okay to make fun of religion. And what's more important now in this world is the world has made it non-relevant. It may have worked for mom and dad, 
but it don't work for me. That's old school. That's old timey religion. That's old stuff. It don't work in this hour we're living in. I want to tell you something. God is still God. He still sits on the throne. And he is crying out to the body of Christ and moms and dads saying, Prove me that I am God. Prove me. Put me to the test. Pray and fast and do what you're supposed to do and put me to the test and I will prove myself to a lost and dying world. He's waiting on us as moms and dads to take up the mantle and run with it. This morning, we've been given marching orders, instructions on what to do, what the task is before us. So that is the task of saving our children and our grandchildren. The task to understand that nobody else is going to do it but us. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want you to look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 6. One more verse of scripture here. I want to share something with you. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, one of read verses 1 through 7. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land where you go to possess. Now right off the bat, they're talking about going to the promised land and going to the land that they, they promised full of milk and honey and all these great things. And what's he saying right off the bat? keep these commandments before you and the judgments which the Lord commanded to teach you that you would do them in the land you go to possess that thou mightest fear the Lord God to keep all the statutes and his commandments which I commanded thee thou and thy son and thy son's son and all the days of thy life and that thy days might be prolonged that goes right back to Ephesians all thy mother and father hear therefore o Israel and observe to do it that it might be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily. See, the thing about it is, God doesn't see. <laughs> I boy, I get sidetracked here and go another way right quick. God didn't expect the church to shrink; He's expecting the church to grow. He says here that you'd increase mightily, that you'd increase mightily, as the Lord God, the fathers, have promised thee, the land that flows with milk and honey. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. With all thy soul, with all thy mind. Jesus, even himself, shared these words in the New Testament. And these words which I command thee this day shall be where? In thine heart. Now look what he says here in verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto who? And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. He said, you got to get the word in your heart and get it right. And you live by it accordingly. And then he's saying, you need to train this next generation and instruct them. Put it in their hearts. He said, talk about, Brother Eugene, he's challenging them here. You talk about God in the morning. You talk about him at night. You talk about the goodness of God in the morning. You talk about the goodness of God in the night. You talk about how great God is. You train, you teach, and instruct these children that's coming up behind you that it will be instilled in their hearts and they will automatically do what they're supposed to do. Listen to me. When's the last time you shared the word with your children? Don't raise your hand for the sake of embarrassment. When's the last time you prayed with them? When's the last time he sought God over, over a situation in their life, knowing they're struggling with something? Better yet, when have they felt comfortable enough to come to you and ask you to pray? Lana got a job offer uh, back out in Arizona one day this week. We was riding around the phone call and uh, got off there and started saying, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And right there in the middle of the riding around, Sister Ellen, she said, Dad, let's pray. I get this job. Right there just driving, driving around with the key. Middle of sight. Let's pray now that I get this job. When is the last time your children came to you and said, Dad, I need you to pray? Dad, I need, I need your insight in this. Dad, I need some instruction. I need some encouragement. Dad, I'm in a low spot. 
and I need some insight. When's the last time that our children saw God in us enough, Sister Ellen, they came to us and said, I can go to my dad. He'll have something for me. He can be able to share us. He'll be able to he'll be able to instruct me. He'll be able to give me he'll be able to give me some words of advice or encouragement. A study was done recently to determine the amount of interaction between fathers and their small children. Fathers and small children. First, the fathers were asked to estimate the amount of time they spent each day communicating with their child. The average answer was about 15 to 20 minutes a day. But here's the thing about it. Next, microphones were attached to the fathers so they could each, uh, each interaction could be recorded. Then it goes to say the, the, the results were shocking. The average amount of time spent by these middle-class fathers with their small children were 37 seconds per day. The direct interaction was limited to 2.7 encounters daily, lasting 10 to 15 seconds each. Uh -uh. If we don't pour into them, the world will. If we don't give them more time, the world's got plenty of time for them. Well, you don't understand. I got to work overtime all the time, and I've got to work, and I've got to volunteer for. I want to tell you something. Real kids don't care how much money you make. Oh, there he goes. Your kids don't care if you work around the clock. They'd rather have your time, and your attention, and your love, and a hug, and a smile. And being with them more than wanting you to work around the clock. At the end of the day, when we go out there and they stand before us at the graveyard, they're not going to say, Oh, my dad made a bunch of money. Well, my dad worked around the clock. What they remember is the relationships they had with their father or their mother. When I was there, when I needed him, he was there. When I needed help, he was there. When I needed something, he was there. He was there. Don't let the schools be the only thing to instruct our children. Are oh, you hearing me this morning? Don't let the school system be the only thing that instructs our children. And I'm not saying that bad about all teachers are bad, but I'm saying it's not the school's responsibility. Mom and Dad, we are responsible for raising our children. I said, well, I go to the Bible that tells us to train up a child in the way they should go. When they get old, they will, not, they will not walk away from it. The one thing we'll never get back with our children is our time. Robert Schuler, which he passed away here, I don't know how long ago it's been. Uh, and all you know, if you know, watching Pastor Cathedral Church, Crystal Cathedral, Cathedral Church, whatever you want to say. And again, you may not agree with everything he taught or says but you can always pick some wisdom out of everything you, you, and he said he said this here he was quoted saying this here uh one place he was quoted saying i choose to fail so i can succeed the guy asked him so what do you mean by that he says i choose to fail at golf because i want to succeed as a father he says though he loved golf immensely he knew he could never devote adequate time to his job, his hobby, and his family, so he gave up his hobby. How are you doing this morning as a dad with your time? If I asked you to rank the things this morning that are most or prioritize your time, what would get first, second, third, fourth? How are we doing with our time? How are we doing with the short few years we get with our children. I've told Andrew, I don't know how many times I were, I said, but I hate that. 16, I told him, I said, I'll, I'll put a cry like a baby when he leaves. And he's the last one to come through the house. I already dread him leaving. Time is short. And Sister Jane, they get away quick. They leave us quick. What are we doing with our time? What are we doing as parents with our time? We're pouring into them. We're making relationship. We're restricting that bond between us and our children. What's the most important thing in your life today, Dad? 
Is it your schedule? Or if we was to look at your schedule, where's your time devoted? What's most important? Where's the main thing at in your life? The story goes here. The story of a man asking his daughter if she would want quality time with her dad or quantity time with her dad. She replied, quality time. Dad has lots of it. Responsibilities every place but her. One girl drew a picture, colored it all up, went to her dad's office, crawled up on his lap and said, Daddy, come see my picture. Dad said, not now, honey. Daddy's busy. About 10 minutes later, she came back again, crawled up on his lap and said, Daddy, will you look at my picture now? Will you see my picture now? Dad got frustrated and said, can't you see I'm busy? Don't bother me right now. I'll come look at your picture after a while when I'm ready. A couple hours later, the dad came out. He said to the daughter, can I see your picture now? And the girl said, sure. And it was a picture of her and her brother and her mom standing on the lawn with the family dog with big smiles on a sunny day, but the dad noticed he was in the picture. So the dad said, that's a nice, not, nice picture, sweetheart, but how come I'm not in the picture? And the girl said, because you're always working in your office, Daddy. You're always working in your office. Time is a gift that you'll never get back. I've said it before, you can lose a job, you can get a job back. You can lose a house, you can get a house back. You can lose a car, you get a car back. But when you lose time, it don't come back. It won't come back around. When years are gone, when years are come flying by, they're not going to get back. Me and Brother Lamb was looking to talk to a guy yesterday, and he was uh, trying to sell a car. And uh, he said something. I don't know if Lynn caught what he said or not. He was showing us a truck, and he, he had this truck in his garage. And he looked at it, and he said, he said I've been working. My wife told me I've been working on this car 15 years. He said, 15 years don't sound a whole lot when you say it fast enough. And I thought, wow. 15 years flew by for him just like that, and he was still working on that truck. We're going to look around one of these days, dads and moms, and say, where'd our children go? Where'd our babies go? Where's the time back? I'd love to get the time back. We're not going to get it back. Time is a gift you'll never get back. You never get it back. You must understand that we have to be an example. Understanding we can do all we, we're supposed to do. Second Kings fourteen to three speaks of King is a king of Israel named Amaziah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and everything he followed the example of his father Joash. What kind of example are you setting for your kids this morning? Your words may say some things about you, but your life declares who you really are. Are you fighting the war with your lives? Are you fighting the war to be faithful? God calls the church his family. And here this morning, there are a lot of, I believe a lot of good dads, a lot of godly dads. I don't, I don't doubt that a bit in my heart. But I want to tell you something. We have enough time. If we make time, we can be in a dad and adopt a child. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about being a mentor to somebody a young person who didn't have a dad. What greater thing can we ever hear than we stand before God Almighty, get into the kingdom of heaven, and, and somebody comes up behind us, Brother Finley says, if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be here. If you hadn't shared a smile with me or invited me to church, or if you hadn't uh, been kind enough to go to a ball game with me and pour into me, I might not be here. If you don't think that makes a difference, go work youth camp sometime. Be a counselor. Be somebody that, that talks and sees what they say. One more story here. Scenario of a young boy is debating whose father was the best. How many of you ever had that debate? My dad's better than yours. My dad can do this. Fathers were debating on who was the best. The discussion highlighted who their fathers knew. The first boy started the debate by claiming his father knew the mayor. He was soon taught by the second boy who said, that's nothing, my dad knows the governor. The stakes were getting higher. Tension raised. The eavesdropping fathers began to wonder what the next kid would say. The last little boy shot back at him with all he had. So what? My dad knows God. Woo.
my dad knows God. Mm. What are our children saying about us? What are our children? I'm going to ask you to stand this morning, if you will. I know it's quiet in here this morning, several away. That's all right. But this morning, what is our legacy going to be as dads, as grandfathers, mothers, grandmothers, whatever the case may be? The strength of the church, if the good Lord tarries long enough, Sister Gerald, the strength of the church is going to be determined by our children and grandchildren that come behind us. We can't blame God. We can't blame the, the country. We can't blame the morals of the world because we're not of this world anyway. We're called to set a higher standard in a higher place. I want to ask you to bow your heads, if you will, this morning. And I want you to pray for our dads, not just our dads, grandfathers, but our men of our church. And pray a challenge prayer in your heart to them. Lord, challenge them to be better. Challenge them to be stronger. Challenge them to walk like they're supposed to walk. I'm going to ask you to take it there by the hands of other close to you, if you will. Jesus, Lord, as we come to your throne this morning, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. It is the day that you've made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it, Lord. It is the day, Lord, that we set aside to honor our fathers, Lord. And, Lord, let us honor, uplift, and encourage, and exhort our fathers, our grandfathers, our uncles, whatever the case may be, Lord. Maybe it's just a spiritual dad, somebody that's poured into us, Lord, that may not even be kin to us, Lord. But, Lord, I thank you, Lord. Help us to honor them, to encourage them, to exhort them, Lord. And, Lord, we plead your blood over our fathers this morning, Lord. Give them strength, Lord, the ability to stand, to make right decisions, Lord, in, in times of chaos, Lord. Let them be, Lord, a stronghold, Lord, a, a place of strength, Lord, I pray. Their families, Lord, that, Lord, they're a refuge, Lord, to when children are hurt, Lord, when children are seeking, Lord, uh, direction in life. Lord, they've got the words of wisdom and encouragement, Lord, to pour into them, Jesus. Lord, I pray you'd give them understanding of your word, Lord. They'd be men of prayer, Lord, men of action, Lord, men of integrity this morning, Lord. They would, Lord, they would allow the Lord to speak to them, Lord, to speak to their children, oh God. Uh, Lord, raise up, Lord, not just the dads that are here, Lord, but the dads that will come into our church. Lord, we expect our church and believe our church is going to grow. And, Lord, let the men that come through these doors, Lord, be men that are hungry to be men of God, Lord, men of valor, Lord. And, Lord, they, Lord, they may bring luggage into this church, Lord. Let them lay it down at the cross, Lord, to be what you've called them to be, Lord. Uh, Lord, we plead the blood over those that come behind us this morning, Lord, our children and grandchildren, Lord, that the example, Lord, we lay, Lord, the footsteps we walk in, Lord, with the footsteps they follow, Lord. And Lord, forgive us where we failed, Lord. Forgive us where we've been short, Lord, sometimes. And forgive us, Lord, we've let the mantle slip, Lord. And Lord, help us to continue to fight the good fight of faith, Lord, our children hanging the balance, Lord. The future of the church hangs in the balance. Thank you, Jesus. 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 And I'm not trying to make nobody mad this morning, but we are going to dismiss tonight. I dismiss on women, on ladies, Mother's Day, and we're going to dismiss. And I'm going to tell you why. Elena, I want you to come down here for a minute. You will. This is one of the two best daughters a dad could have. And I ain't got to see her. I'll have seen her, but I've had, I've, I'm not a full-time pastor. I, I get to work. Okay? And I'm not trying to knock anybody from me having to work. I don't want to think that that's a crutch. But she's going back to Arizona Tuesday. I've, got, I've been working most of the time. She's been home. I want to enjoy this afternoon with her. Thank you, Brother Finley. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're mad over dismissing, you got my permission to go to another church tonight. But I want to encourage you to take your dads out, just like I say with the mothers on Mother's Day. Take your dad out to eat today. Take your grandparent, your grandfather out to eat today. Spend quality time with them. Laugh with them. Cry with them. Share with them. And pour into them. And strengthen that relationship. Because church just ain't about being these four walls, Brother Jamie. Church is anywhere we desire to let Jesus shine in our life.
whether it's at Walmart, Kmart, Burger King, wherever it is, in the backyard with a neighbor cooking a hamburger, when our light shines, that's where our church is at. Stay with your family this afternoon. Love them. That's my heart of break here Tuesday morning about 6 o'clock when she goes home. Unless Brother Everett will dismiss the word of prayer. We thank you for uh, seeing our service this morning, for watching us. We hope something was said that stirs your heart and calls you to want to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The word tells us in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to reconcile us back to him. We just want to pray with you right quick if you'll give us a chance to pray with you. Jesus, Lord, as we come to your throne right now, we just ask you, Lord, whoever's listening today, whoever saw this message, Lord, their heart would be changed and turned for you, Jesus. Lord, they accept you as their Savior, Lord. We ask your blessings on whatever they're going through. Give them strength and a made-up mind to see it through with your help. In Jesus' name, amen. We want you to contact us, if you will. Follow us through heartlandharvest.org or follow us on Facebook. We hope to see you soon in our services. Amen.